Thank you very much, Wayne. I'd like to thank you and Anita and the LA84 Foundation for hosting this meeting today on a topic which I think is of great importance at all levels of sport, but certainly even more so for our youth. I'm not expecting everybody in this room to agree with my opinions, but I want you to just simply understand where they're coming from, and then I think we can all move forward. Some disclosures, but no conflicts. Football right now is undergoing its third major crisis. The first one happened in 1905 when it almost ended, but Teddy Roosevelt, as he would later do in, in San Juan Hill in Puerto Rico, rode in and rescued football, and out of it came the NC2A in 1906, whose founding mission was to protect the athletes. That's why it was founded. The second major crisis was that of 1968-69, in which there were 38 deaths, many of them from quadriplegia, which was at that time not nearly so well managed on the field, uh, and the others from head injuries. And out of that came Noxie and helmet standards and better helmets than have ever been uh, on athletes before, and a precipitous diminishment in the number of deaths, so that although there are in most years several, and unfortunately, tragically, this year already four, and we haven't played a game yet at the high school level, um, the number of deaths have plummeted downward and the number of subdural hematomas have come way down. We're in our third cr crisis now, and it's a crisis of the last several years and, and currently this year and going forward for a few more years, and it's the concussion crisis. And I hope we can kind of understand a little bit about what's going on with this injury uh, and then why I feel the way I do about our very young uh, athletes. Uh, needing to be protected greater than they are currently. Uh, the website, Robert C. Cantu, MD, is a resource for uh, videos, information um, that you may or may want. I'm sorry, a lot of you have seen this before. Um, they don't practice that drill at the pro level, so obviously that drill shouldn't be practiced at any level, and it definitely shouldn't ever be practiced uh, for youth. The book, Concussion in Our Kids, talks about trying to reduce head trauma, especially for our youth, but the whole mantra of it is basically trying to make sports as safe as they can be at whatever level. And that's what we've been working on for a long time, whether it be at the NFL level or whether it be at the youth level. I'm not here today to point fingers about a few bad actors, uh, no matter uh, what uh, they may be, but rather try to make the case for reducing head trauma. Well, the sports news, three of, uh, NFL players announced yesterday they will donate their brains to science after they die. Actually, they were going to ask Brett Favre do that, but they're afraid after he died, he changed. Um, I only threw that clip in because obviously part of the heightened awareness today is because this subject is out in the media and is being talked about. And it, it, were it not for the media's involvement, probably the crisis wouldn't be recognized by as many people. But I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Some facts about football, and I'm not saying don't play football. I'm not making that case at all, but just some realities are 97% of catastrophic injuries come from that sport, at least those seen at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It has the highest concussion rate of all of our school sports, but not much higher than soccer, ice hockey, and so I wouldn't really get too hyped up on that. At least reported concussions, recognized concussions. I'm going to give you some information and some real food for thought about subconcussive blows before I'm through, and I hope you'll understand that you don't even need to have a concussion to wind up with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and we're not trying to scare anybody, it's just a reality that we've seen it in a number of individuals in Boston that have never had a recognized concussion. And it's important to understand that in football, it's the act of tackling that more than 80% of the injuries of significance occur, almost all the catastrophic ones occur in that particular act. Certainly it's the most common thing for concussion. 
I want to make it very clear I'm pro sport. I want kids playing sports. I want kids playing sports at higher levels than they're playing them right now. But I want sports, I think we've seen him, but I think, I think we want sports to be played in a safer manner than they are currently being played. We can today, through through the laboratory, mimic every kind of collision that happens in every sport, whether it be a helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision, whether it be a punch to the head, whether it be a fall and the head striking, um, or a baseball striking a pitcher. In my day, we used to be taught to field, but nowadays they don't. No, seriously. The, the falls can be simulated by the drop test, which is the, currently the way Noxie rates football helmets. Um, the helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision test can be simulated by a linear impactor that will impact the head with measured g-forces. The punch can be simulated by a swinging pendulum device and projectiles hitting the head can be simulated by shooting out of an air cannon a baseball, a softball, or whatever it is that you want. So from the laboratory, we can come up with theoretical thresholds for concussion. But do we have really a true concussion threshold? And the answer is no. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it is partly because the data we're getting it from, whether it be the hit system or whatever, is not infinitely accurate. But the major reason is concussions are not just all about biomechanical forces. They're not just about acceleration, whether it be linear or rotational, the more injurious type. It's about duration of impact, location of impact, how much tissue strain. Yeah, that's biomechanical stuff. That's only part of it. The other part that's almost never, and I've never seen it in a, in a published publication, all of the biological mixed with the biomechanical. And the biologic has to do with how many concussions you've had before, how severe they were, the proximity of those concussions, whether or not the person saw the blow coming, how strong their necks were, the age of the individual, the gender of the individual, hydration, and of course the underreporting, which in certain sports like football, the majority of concussions, many of us still think are missed as compared with those that are recognized. So whenever you read a report, and I'll show you data at the end of my talk that'll talk about people with damage shown on fiber tracks, metabolic studies, uh, intellectual studies, cognitive studies, and blood-brain barrier breakdown who never had a recognized concussion. Well, whether they had a recognized concussion doesn't necessarily mean they didn't have a concussion. Maybe those were all sub-concussive blows. Maybe they weren't. We have a tremendous paucity of data at the youth level, and we desperately need more of it accumulated. We have some at the high school and a lot at college and none at the pros because so far the pros haven't agreed to allow themselves to be instrumented. But what data we have at the high school level suggests, interestingly enough, that the blows that the high school player takes on the mean is higher than they are at the, at the college level. And that's probably because of the weak necks that the high school players have on average compared with at the more advanced collegiate level. But what I want to focus in, because I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, is that there are more hits per game in this study of 16,502 hits over the course of a season. 15.5 happen per game, 9.4 per practice. So obviously per day, you're going to have more in gameplay. But how many times do you hit in practice? And unlike the pros that don't even hit once a week now, once the season starts, college players, high school players, youth players 
are hitting on multiple days of the week. And so they're going to get a lot more head trauma and more concussions if people are there to recognize them uh, at practice over a course of a season than they would. Uh, the other thing is the highest hits that are recorded in this one particular study of this year were hits to the top of the head, and the top of the head is can't do that. That's, that's illegal. Of course, it is done, but it's just not called. Food for thought about young brains. Young brains are not myelinated as much as adults. You're really going to be in your 20s before you're fully myelinated, but at the very young ages, much of the brain is unmyelinated. That's a covering of the axon. It's kind of like the color, coloring or covering of a telephone wire. It helps transmission. It gives strength, and so less chance to disrupt a given axon at the adult level compared with the kid level. Kid levels are more susceptible to the dysautoregulation syndrome and the excitotoxic shock of concussion. Young brains are housed in big heads on weak necks, so this bobblehead doll effect is going to mean that a given impact is going to have a greater acceleration of the brain because it's going to move the head more than it would an adult that's got a strong neck. And young brains are lighter than adult brains. They're smaller, they're not as heavy, so there's less inertia. The same amount of impact is gonna move that brain tissue and jiggle it back and forth a lot more than it would at the adult level. Youngsters also tend to have weak torsos, and so if they tumble, they can't keep their head from slamming back on the turf as well as an adult could. Their equipment often is not as good uh, as adult equipment. They have difficulty expressing the symptoms of concussion and tend not to alert their coaches as well as an adult might who's been trained in what are concussion symptoms. Often they have no medical access on the sideline. Coaches are sometimes not as experienced as more adult coaches and I've yet to really see informed consent for our youngest. I'm a believer that if you believe in what you're talking about and you have the science behind you that no matter what, over time, things can change. 2009, we were at opposite ends of the spectrum, so to speak, with the National Football League, and one year later, uh, they're putting me on as a senior advisor. Um, I don't know whether exactly all that means, but at least I have input. I have the ability to talk to Jeff Pash or to, on occasion, Roger. In terms of concussion protection, I'm very quickly going to go through quite a wide range of subjects here because I want to get you thinking, but I want to just make a blanket statement that there are a lot of products out there that claim to reduce concussion that are about as good as that product. All of these products are claimed by the manufacturer to do something, but only the manufacturer's got the data. It's not been independently validated by any third-party labs, and consequently, um, it's, it's something that should be more or less viewed uh, in that light. These products involve quite a wide range of now recording devices that can record hits to the head. And I think that's very important and that's very good because we're going to be able to use them to develop science. But the accuracy of how those hits are in terms of most of them record only linear acceleration, some record both linear and rotational, the accuracy is something to be seen uh, down the line. I think it's important to understand and University of South Carolina has spent some pretty big bucks putting the Guardian head apparatus on a helmet. Any time, no matter how well intended, anybody puts something in a helmet between the padding, alters the padding of the helmet, puts something on the outer shell of the helmet, they are voiding the warranty of the helmet if the manufacturer so chooses. And so if somebody gets hurt, more likely than not, that's going to happen. So any of these products that go on a helmet or in a helmet have that issue. And the companies 
that make those products have not gone to the manufacturers and cut a deal that says they're going to keep the warranty. Products, on the other hand, which fit on your head like a, um, a skull cap or a headband or a mouth guard or a chin strap accelerometer, things that don't affect the weight or the configuration of the helmet, those products do not in any way affect the warranty of the helmet. But these that do, uh, it's, it's, it's beware. There are a number of sideline tests that are coming out um, to uh, allow us to better be able to predict if somebody has a concussion or not. Um, a test like the King Div Divic test that uses essentially just visually num uh, looking at numbers and how quickly you can do this and the numbers originally are all lined up and then eventually start to go offline and allows you to need eye tracking capabilities to do it are probably going to be better than some of the others because so many different circuits of the brain are involved with vision, not just our occipital cortex, but our cerebellum coordinating the extraocular movements that are necessary for the eye tracking. But all of these products that will come out to tout uh, concussions are, in my estimation, something to be viewed as one tool in the toolbox. I think they're all fine, but don't think they're going to be infinitely accurate. Bobby's here, and I love what he's done with the tackling for youngsters. Technique is a huge thing if taught properly, can avoid a lot of unnecessary head trauma. Much of it happens with poor technique. Rules changes certainly have their role, and in ice hockey in Canada, they've now outlawed in the National Hockey League intentional checks to the head, intentional, intentionally targeting the head. And the Ivy League is the first college league that has started to limit practice, much like the pros have limited it, uh, with two fully padded practices allowed per week. And during the, the two-a-day sessions, only one of the two can be fully padded uh, practices. Other things, though, that you can do to reduce the amount of head trauma is take a lesson from John Gagliardi. No, Joe. Papa wasn't the winningest college football coach before they took away a bunch of victories. John Gagliardi was, with over 800 victories at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. John did not have any tackling once the season started. I'll show you or describe to you some other coaches that have gone to this, but essentially they wrapped up the players, but they didn't bring anybody to the ground. That was saved for game day didn't seem to hurt his winning percentage too much. Because of the ability to measure hits, we can now figure out the number of hits a player is taking over the course of a season. And that has caused Chris Nowinski, the co-founder uh, and president and CEO of Sports Legacy and myself, to have going what's called the Hit Count Initiative, in which we are taking uh, something from baseball, the, the sport that we played through college, and kind of taking the hit count that is used for little league pitchers and applying a head hit count for athletes in all sports. It's interesting to me to think that we are protecting the arms of our youngsters, which is a very good uh, idea. We even uh, have fewer pitches that are allowed at the earliest ages as opposed to older ages. By the way, there's really no science behind any of this. This is just best guessed, less is better, uh, even though it's been around for a long time. Um, but it has worked out and has minimized um, young individuals having serious arm problems at a very uh, early age, though it has not eliminated it. The hit sensors started with a Simbex system, which were six accelerometers in between the padding of a Riddell Revolution helmet. Now we have eight different companies that are out there with various different products that will register hits. 
Uh, as I said, some are on a headband, some are on a skull cap, some are uh, in a mouth guard, some are in earbuds, uh, some are in a chin strap, a lot of different products. Um, so we can measure these hits. It's still amazing to me to think the ulnar collateral ligament that can be repaired, we have people pitching in the big leagues with three Tommy John surgeries going strong, and we have a pitch count for little leaguers, but the brain, which can't be repaired if damaged, we don't have a hit count yet for the brain. Why a hit count? Well, fewer hits should mean fewer concussions. Fewer hits mean fewer subconcussive injuries. And with a very high percentage of concussions going undiagnosed, especially in the sport of football, fewer hits to the head means fewer undiagnosed concussions as well. Also, an individual that has a very high hit count compared with other people on the team, it's probably a technique issue. And as an outlier, he can be scrutinized in terms of whether he's using his head too much in the act of tackling. Is there a CTE threshold, a threshold for developing that later life neurodegenerative process called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, first described over 80 years ago in boxers? Probably, but we don't know it. What we do know is that no brain trauma is good for the brain and less is better. So we're not saying don't play a sport, but let's take out unnecessary trauma whenever you can. And the thing that allows us to take the trauma out most easily is practice, because practice can be done without necessarily colliding heads. Practice can be done with dummies and mannequins not bashing heads against each other. Over time, we hope to come up with a, a hit count in terms of numbers of hits which seem acceptable, and also come up with a hit count that will have an algorithm whereby a hit of 80 G uh, will have a higher weight than a hit, obviously, of 20 G. These are the medical advisors to the hit count initiative, um, people that are quite active in the biomechanical and concussion field. And that's kind of the mantra. What is the role of the helmet in concussion prevention? Well, if you made it big enough, it probably would prevent concussion. But just like you can't play the skills of the sport with a helmet like that, the other way to make the helmet much more uh, effective is to affix it to the shoulder pads so that when you take a blow to the head, the forces are transmitted not to your neck and to the brain, but to the shoulder pads. Once again, if your helmet is fixed on the shoulder pads, that also pretty much eliminates skills of the sport. We can't put a Hans device on our football players and still have them play football. Helmets do a fabulous job of preventing skull fracture. We almost go most years without any of them now. And they do a very good job of reducing the most serious injuries, the subdural hematomas. They're down 80%. What they don't do is a good job of preventing concussion because concussion happens mostly from a violent change in the position of the head, from a blow or a whiplash injury. And that violent change is not going to be dramatically impacted by a, by a helmet. What the helmet will do is a fabulous job of focal compressive forces, like if you had a ball peen hammer and bopped me over the head, I got a depressed skull fracture. I had a helmet on, I don't even probably have a concussion. But something with the forces and the masses that are being transmitted where the head is gonna be dramatically swiveled, the, the helmets are just, I don't believe, the solution and probably never will be. Well, sorry, that was supposed to be um, <laughs> Seinfeld talking about helmets. I don't know what the it's jet lag or whether me, but the, the <laughs> videos aren't lining up. Um, National Football League, I think, is in an embarrassing position. For money, they sidled with one helmet and, and took money to allow that helmet to display its logo uh, as the only logo you can see on TV. And they've got one more year um, with their relationship, and I'm quite certain 
that that relationship will be terminated um, after this coming year. That, by the way, was not anything Roger Goodell had anything to do with. It was in place uh, before he came on board. With regard to helmets, just to mention a word about the star rating system. This is a brainchild of, of um, Stefan Duma, who's an excellent biomechanist, came from the automobile industry background where they rate crashes one to five. And so some, it sounds like a pretty good idea to rate helmets one to five, and a five star being the best and four and so on. The only problem is, is that Helmets don't prevent concussion, whether it's five-star, four-star, three-star, two-star. To say that a five-star prevents more concussions than a three-star is a purely theoretical calculation. It is not based on any on-the-field uh, studies at all. And the studies that were done used only a large size helmet, so whether the the larger helmet extrapolates down to youth helmets and smaller helmets uh, has never really been studied. So the different helmet models that are not this one single large may react very differently. And these helmets were not tested at different temperatures and they were not tested under game condition. It's a purely in the lab theoretical study that one helmet has a little bit better chance to absorb um, largely linear uh, accelerations than another, and so it gets a five star, three star, two star. There's no statistical <laughs> significance how they made it a four versus a five, and there's no on field correlation between real life concussions. So the National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment, which sets the helmet certification standards, cautions that focusing too much on stars can lead to false sense of security about helmets. Terry O'Neill uh, was a former television executive. He um, was responsible for putting John Madden uh, together with Pat Summerall, who was the greatest marriage of listening to pro games call that I've, that I've ever heard. He's come up, and we're supporting him, and a lot of people are supporting him, Mike Ditka and, and others, with a whole new concept that comes out of the Bill Walsh era of the National Football League. It's called, it's called practice like pros, and the idea is to practice without contact, much like Bobby's tackling without the helmets. And what this is is a bunch of speed drills in which the individuals work on their technique simulating game conditions but rather than take somebody and wrap them up and drop them to the ground, they touch them and then let them go or hold them up. So the high, whole idea of this is uh, trying to avoid um, significant contact in the act of practice. And does this work? One of the uh, coaches at a recent clinic is a former pro coach, Buddy Tevens, who's currently the Dartmouth football coach. And he was amazed that in his own experience, he's been doing this now for three years, um, that he's had a marked reduction in injury rate and also has um, actually found that tackling technique skills of his players have been enhanced. And the recommendations in terms of the preseason is that no more than one full pad practice be on any given day. The other one, if it's a two a day, be not padded practice. And then in season one, 90 minute session of full contact per week. Off season recommendations from this practice like pros have not yet come forward, but I feel strongly that why not emulate the pros who have no contact in the off season? And unfortunately, we see college players, and even more so at the high school levels. In some states, there's spring ball. In Florida, they play games in the spring uh, and other states. And in this state, uh, I know that there was, um, in certain areas of the state, decisions made by school committees that they weren't going to allow off-season full contact, and that included going to summer camps and having uh, drills that were full contact. That doesn't mean you can't go to camp. That doesn't mean you can't have a summer camp for football. It just means that full scale uh, 
collision tackling is just not one of the things uh, that are done. And if we think that this isn't uh, important, um, just yesterday I added this to the talk, um, the fourth high school player who's died this year from practice. There hasn't been a game. I believe strongly that youth sports need to have all the head trauma that can come out of it, out of it. And I realize it's controversial, and I realize that not everyone will agree. That's fine. But I don't believe in tackling in the sport of football, because that's the injurious activity, until the age of 14. And I believe in soccer, heading shouldn't happen until the age of 14 either. And I believe in ice hockey, the same full body checking shouldn't happen to the age of 14 three years ago. They were checking at 11-year-olds. Now it has gone to 13. They're almost there in ice hockey now. I want to leave you with some food for thought before I hopefully take a few questions. And I've left time uh, so that we can do that, because that's the fun part of this for me. I want to go through some studies in which individuals were tested preseason and either toward the end of the season or very far or after the season with a variety of modalities. And this is a study from Purdue. It involved functional MRI and involved impact testing, cognitive computer-based testing, compared preseason with postseason, found damage in individuals. If I can, I'm sorry, I didn't bring my pointer, but 50% of players with no clinically observed impairments showed significant alterations during in-season functional MRI testing. And the same was true of individuals that were tested cognitively using the impact test. The players who had the greatest chance for these findings were those that took the greatest number of hits, and especially hits to the front and top of the head. Totally different study using diffusion tensor <coughs> imaging, DTI MRI, looking at fiber tracks. Different sport. I'm not picking on football, soccer, ice hockey. Both of the sports <coughs> followed with DTI show deterioration in fiber tracks over the course of the season. No recognized concussions. And more recently, out of the Cleveland Clinic and Rochester, University of Rochester, this study that looked at breakdown of the blood-brain barrier as defined by leakage of protein S100B that shouldn't be there and antibodies to the leakage of that S100B protein that shouldn't be there. And the hypothesis was that the breakdown would correlate with individuals that had the highest number of hits to the head. They looked at 67 college football players with pre and post game blood draws, number of hits recorded by video analysis, and then a subset had DTI examination as well. Others had uh, cognitive and functional assessment. No players had a concussion. That was recognized. So all of these studies that say these are no, no concussions, I'm not going there because we know concussions happen that aren't recognized, but at least they weren't recognized. The S100B protein was highest in those players that had the greatest number of presumably subconcussive blows. The autoimmune antibody to S100B protein logically was also highest in those with the greatest number of hits. And those with the greatest number of hits are those the ones that had the DTI abnormalities and abnormal scoring on impact testing. These are individuals that have had chronic traumatic encephalopathy diagnosed in their brains that had illustrious National Football League careers. Currently, 34 out of 35 brains that we've studied from the National Football League have had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, but that doesn't really mean a lot in the sense that these were all very symptomatic brains. 
individuals had the clinical triad, had the cognitive issues with recent memory impairment and those more advanced executive function impairments, had behavioral difficulties with mood, depression, uh, paranoid behavior, um, and also had behavior issues of the short fuse, couldn't hang on to frustrating circumstances. So not a great surprise that these very symptomatic people wound up with CTE. But with regard to the sub-concussive issue, you probably recently come across this former Michigan player, Colin Finnerty, who died. His brain was studied. It had stage two CTE. And if we want to get into what the staging is and the question part, I'm happy to do that. Um, he had only one recognized concussion during his career. So at least it wasn't recognized concussions that caused him chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It presumably was the amount of subconcussive trauma. Well, today we have an awful lot of hype in the media about what we're talking about today. And unfortunately, the science lags behind, although that that is there is very worrisome. And these are just some of the people that we've had the opportunity in some cases to get to know, but mostly get to know their brains. And I thank you. I purposely left 15 minutes for uh, questions because I hope that we can engender a discussion. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to start feeling them now. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. First one, uh, that document that said recommendations practice like pros, which you indicated how much time you, is there anywhere I can get that, number one? And number two, uh, in regards to uh, giving uh, an assessment for youth coaches of how much tapping a child should be doing, I actually asked the same question on heads up. Uh, and they have no idea in regards to what is sufficient. In other words, there's two things. As a coach, you want to make sure the kids can tackle, number one. Tackle correctly, number two, which is, you know, we go to Bobby uh, Hosea. But the re at, what I'm asking is how much time is enough? Enough, Because there's no set chart. Right. I am in charge of my, my, my coaches. So I, I try to take as much information as I can and tell them, hey, you know what, this is what, this is what I want you doing. And that's why I'm asking you. I don't think there's any solid signs behind how much is enough. And when we have been involved with practice like the pros, the one recurring theme that we hear from high school coaches, um, and that's the same could be true of youth coaches, although this has been practice like the pros has been aimed at high schools and that's the people that are being invited or the coaches, is, well, it's all right at the pro level. They know how to tackle. They don't have to practice it every week, you know, once every other week is good enough. We're teaching these kids how to practice and, you know, so you have to do it every day or three times, four times a week. We're not asking that the technique of tackling, like Bobby isn't asking, isn't done. We're just asking don't bash heads to do it. You can learn on mannequins. You can learn on, on tackling devices and one of the most Incredible, if I, I will have the video of this eventually, I, I, you know, I just have to get it. At Dartmouth, one of the things that Buddy Tevens has done, they've got a uh, tire that is dragged behind a garden tractor um, that's got a little more juice than mine does. And there's a, uh, it's like a doll, but view it as a mannequin that's affixed to the tire. So as the tire bounces along, this thing is swinging wildly in all directions. And the drill is you got to tackle it, wrap it up, roll over, and let go. It's a heck of a tough drill. It's not easy to tackle this thing. But more inventive things like that, um, and like Bobby has done, that's what we need, I believe. We, we just can't be doing it with live bodies. The, the price is too high to pay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, is there any uh, data or information about other uh, team contact sports like rugby or Australian rules football for CTE? Um, there's very limited data. Um, 
there are cases of CTE in rugby. There are cases of CTE in soccer. There are probably cases in Australian rules football, though I can't remember seeing one that's been published, but I have no doubt that there are cases of it. They're just not necessarily in the literature. The problem is, for every case that's published, there's probably 1,000 or 10,000 or something that's out there if it's fairly common. And if what you're getting at is take the helmets off football players, it's not practical. It can't be done. You can't play the sport without a helmet on. The danger's too great. You trade skull fractures and deaths for fewer concussions, and, and, and I wouldn't go there. Yes, sir? Um, basically, when you were just saying the lap dances, um, if football took a step back, um, I'm not saying leather helmets or anything like that, but has that been studied in any form of a way? Because I know with basically the composite hel helmets that are used out there today, you know, the kids are trained to hit, but unfortunately, I believe strongly, and I'll answer your question, but I want to get at it from something else. I believe strongly that you should have helmets on girls playing field hockey and girls playing lacrosse. And the governing bodies fight it tooth and nail, saying it would turn the sport more violent. No. Get rid of the referees who won't call the sport right. And the same is true of football. The rules are there. You can't hit with your front of your helmet. You can't line a guy up intentionally blocking or tackling with a helmet. The National Football League has even gone now so far as to say at that level you can't duck your head and hit with the top of your helmet. So Peterson's going to have to unlearn and he probably can't do it at that stage quickly but over time he probably will and and people will be better off. No, I don't think that the way to go is to, the helmets that are there today are better than any helmets that have ever been made. The downside of them is it doesn't hurt to hit with your head. They're so good, or it doesn't hurt much. And so, because it works, it's evolved. It's, it's, it's been used for quite a while. But the game, to me, just needs to be officiated correctly. And if the officials can't do it right, get rid of them. Get rid, get get some officials in there that can. They're not. Their their feet are not being held to the fire the way they should be, because the trauma that's being allowed to occur by them, they don't seem to understand the the issue. In a boxing ring, in combat arts, the role of the official is to protect the athlete, first and foremost. In some states they still score, most they don't. Their role is to protect the athlete. That's the mindset that I'd love all officials in all contact sports to have, and I think we need it. Yes, sir? There's a lot of discussion about uh, tapping techniques and equipment. Have there been any statistic statistically significant studies about the playing surface? I would imagine that on an artificial surface, you're going to have more head trauma versus artificial gra uh, natural grafts. Artificial surface clearly is harder, and you've seen uh, going away from it with products that have come about that more simulate grass and definitely are softer for impact. And I don't think anybody that's ever played on carpeted concrete would prefer to play on it. Yes, sir. Great question, there isn't any. And some 14-year-olds are physiologically 12 or 10, and others are 18. So why 14? Well, you gotta start sometime, and to me, you start in college, uh, pardon me, you start in high school if you wanna play the sport and have a passion for it. Um, I don't have any problem with someone who hasn't yet got axillary hair or pubic hair, and obviously is way behind in their development, saying, well, not, not ready yet. 15, still not ready yet. You know, this idea you got to learn these techniques when you're 5, 6, 14, 15 is bull roar. Tom Brady didn't play till he was in college. The all time leading, I see Ray here, the all time leading tight end, Tony Gonzalez in professional football, was a basket player for Cal, didn't play football till he got in the National Football League. 
So if you're a God-given, talented athlete with incredible physical and emotional and toughness genes, you're not going to be as good if you've never done it, but you'll pick it up pretty quick. I think, Ray, you said you started senior in high school? Yeah. All league? Yeah, just played football for all league. You played UCLA, but I was all that A couple more minutes if you have questions. Yes, sir. Uh, without data from rugby, how could one be certain that tackling without commerce would lead to greater casualties? 1905, when the sport almost died. It, it died because of 18 deaths, almost all of them skull fractures. And yeah, they had kind of helmets on some of the players, but they weren't really helmets. So you can't really play the sport at the speed that it's played, I think, without a helmet. I think you need one. I think you should have one. Um, and uh, there is very serious head trauma that comes out of rugby. And if rugby were played in the numbers that you play football, you see, you, that statistic, the majority of concussions in high school sports come from football. 97% of all catastrophic injuries come from Yeah, but I should have said, and thank you for giving me the opportunity, per 100,000 participants, it's no higher in football than it is in gymnastics, than it is in ice hockey, in terms of concussion, soccer, and if you compare it to the flyer in cheerleading, it's less risky. And if you compare it to the pole vaulter, track is safe, the pole vaulter isn't. Pole vaulting in track is more risky than playing football in terms of head and spine injury. So all these things need to kind of the yin and the yang, I think. One more question. Yes, sir. The 16,000 high school, college, Those were, those were, um, uh, high school impacts. Those were that was a that was a team cumulatively that accumulated that number of hits. Um, roughly 15 per game, nine and change per practice. But if you look at the total number of hits to the head, they were higher in practice than they were in gameplay because they played 14 games and practiced 33 times in that particular study. Thank you.